come up here. Hi. Thank you for thank you for coming in and foregoing the Google cafeteria for a for a lunchtime. Nobody for, <laughs> nobody forewent it. It didn't get foregone. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to do a little calibration first. How many of you are, are scientists, are uh, computer or otherwise here? Okay. How many of you are drinkers? Drinkers in the room. <laughs> it's my people. Hi. Good to see you. I'm sure, we run into each other in the bar. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to be talking about drinking. Uh, and talking about it with, I hope, a little bit of context. Other people have talked about drinks before. Someone else, for example, this gentleman, you recognize him? Any history people? That's Ben Franklin. Uh, he is, uh, he's quoted famously as saying that wine is proof that God loves us. Um, which, is, uh, which is actually pretty profound, because it, it gets at the idea that there is um, some kind of connection between, um, between booze and the divine, right? Or, or I suppose between us and divine, if you will. Uh, nothing, nobody cares for the dumb puns? I would think that would be, all right, fine. I'm going to do more of them, so you have to get used to it. That's a thing that's going to happen for the next few minutes. Uh, it's actually a misquote. It's not what Franklin said. What Franklin actually said was that the rain falling on grapes, which then are made into wine, is a constant proof that God loves us and wants to see us happy. And, and that's actually even more potent. Uh, because it indicates a, um, an intimate connection with the process, with nature. And that's part of what I want to argue today. It's not my favorite booze quote, though, the Franklin quote. My favorite one comes from him. Any English majors? Close. William Faulkner. <laughs> not close at all. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought the Ogden Nash was a car. Wasn't that a Ford or something? Uh, no. A noted drinker, William Faulkner, right, uh, who said this. Civilization begins with distillation. Um, and so we could be good uh, high school English students first and talk about the metaphor there, right, that civilization is about boiling down and getting the essence of stuff. And, and, uh, and, and, and you know, that, that's the etymology of the word, sure. It's the etymology of the word yeast, too. Interestingly, not a coincidence. But I, I want today to be more literal about it. I'm going to argue that the human relationship with booze is actually the story of how Homo sapiens became people. It's the way that we settled down. It's how we became civilized. It's how we learned to use what was happening in our environment naturally, and eventually how we learned to make something completely new, right? how we became technological. OK, so can I prove this? Let me try. We'll start here at the beginning. That's yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, sugar-eating mushroom that makes beer. The name is a little on the nose, perhaps. Right? But um, what yeast does fundamentally is eats sugar and then excretes carbon dioxide and ethanol, the alcohol that we drink. Uh, don't panic. <laughs> this, isn't, this, is the, I'm, this is the only, there's only one more that looks like this in the whole deck. Uh, this is only interesting for two reasons. This is, this is a yeast, meta, yeast metabolism. This is what made sure that I was not going to be a biologist. This has made sure that I was going to be a writer. But um, two things I want to point out here. The green, the little green uh, down in the lower right, is, uh, is energy. ATP is the, the way a, a yeast and you and I uh, make energy. And um, it's what we use for, it's the power source in our bodies. So this is yeast taking in glucose up in the upper left, turning it into ATP. But then the box is the interesting part. Because the box is yeast using an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase 1 to turn something called acetaldehyde into ethanol and then excreting it, but also using alcohol dehydrogenase 2 to take that ethanol and convert it back to acetaldehyde. Basically, yeast eats its own poop, is the point. But, but that brings to rise an important question. Why does yeast make alcohol? Not philosophically. I don't know, it's not like an existential question. But, but like evolutionarily, why does yeast make alcohol? So there's two possibilities prompted by that little box. One of them is that ethanol is chemical warfare. What do you do when you want to clean out a cut? Use alcohol, right? Alcohol is really good at killing microbes. It's a microbicide. So maybe yeast is using ethanol to kill competitors locally. Yeast can tolerate really high levels of ethanol. Other microbes can't. It makes its own chemical weapon. Or, so that's what ADH1 suggests, right? Or ADH2 says, well, maybe ethanol is just a food source. It's, it's storing away nuts for the winter in, a, you know, in the microbial way, right? So which is it? OK. 
How do you figure that out? That is what this guy tried to do. This is a researcher named Stephen Benner. He invented a field called paleogenetics. Paleogenetics is a little bit like, you know how linguists will try to figure out what the, what the first word for something was by looking at what the word is in all different languages and finding what the similarities are and kind of trying to back trace it? He figured out you could do the same thing for enzymes. That if you would take all the samples of that enzyme from a bunch of different organisms, in this case, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeast, and a lot of related species, look at the various alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes, you could build, as he did, his team did, 12 different versions of the, the primordial ADH, what the first one looked like. They called it ADHA. They didn't know exactly how it was going to work, so they had 12 different versions. And what they wanted to do was run the, run the equation, let it run, look at the kinetics, and see what it wanted to do. Did it want to make acetaldehyde into ethanol or make ethanol into acetaldehyde? So they did it. And what happened? Turned out ADHA was a lot more like the one that made the ethanol. Yeast wants to make ethanol. So problem solved. Chemical weapon, right? No, of course not. Right? It's not that easy. I said that yeast eats sugar, right? 150 million years ago, when yeast are first figuring this out, where's the sugar? Sugarcane hasn't evolved yet because grasses haven't evolved yet. Sugarcane is a grass. Well, plants where yeast lived were uh, mostly were, were conifers. They were, you know, like pine trees, like on the right there. No. My right. Uh, Yeast probably lived exposed to the air on these things, on tree sap exudates, right, on, on little blurbs of sap. Like, you know, when you come near a pine tree, right, and you get sap on your hand, they, that's where the yeast lived. And so, because ethanol is volatile, it wants to evaporate, and this is going to be important later as a property, that's a really good property to have in a waste product, right? That's perfect sewage. Have ethanol, and then it evaporates. But then about 100 million years later, about 50 million, no, sorry, about 50 million years later, 100 million years ago, in the Cretaceous period, the fruity plants take over from the pine trees, the fruiting flowering plants. Those are the angiosperms, right? The, the other plant there is amborella. It's the very first angiosperm. And yeast now are pre-adapted to live inside those fruits where all the simple sugar is that they want to eat because they can tolerate higher level, levels of ethanol. They're making their own ethanol, and they can hang out inside that fruit. So they look pre-evolved. They look ready. What it actually is is a coincidence, right? But because they're adapted to do that, they have the, the, the luck to do what needs to be done in a changing world because the other animals that couldn't handle the change to angiosperms, to flowering fruiting plants, went extinct. It was an extinction level event for like, well, let's put it this way. The dinosaurs that figured out how to deal with fruiting flowering plants are birds, right? The point I want to make about this, mostly other than I just kind of think it's a cool sort of set of deductions from the lab, is that fermentation happens without us, right? It, it doesn't need us. If, a, if, a, if yeast makes ethanol in the forest, does anyone get drunk to hear it or something, right? Like if nobody's there, you know, it, 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 it still happens. There's still fermentation. It occurs. It occurred for millions and millions of years before human beings came on the scene. But then we did. So this is a shard of a pot. It's a nine or 10,000 years old. Found at an archaeological site in China called Jiahu. Jiahu is a really interesting site. It's one of the places where the first instances of rice being consumed by human beings was found. It's one of the first places where there was evidence of written language. It's one of the oldest places where they found musical instruments, right? It's one of the places where civilization began, right? Where all of the things that we think make us civilized people happened first. Well, one of the things they found was this pot with some weird residue inside. You can guess, probably it's not a spoiler to say what that residue is going to be, but they didn't know what it was at the time. So the researchers who were working the site sent for this analytical chemist, a guy named uh, Patrick McGovern. He works at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, ran a bunch of tests, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, a Feigl spot test. He shot lasers at it. He did all the cool stuff you can do if you have a lab at Penn and found uh, three things. Not ethanol. I mentioned ethanol is volatile. Right? Ethanol evaporates. So in the, even in the oldest samples, even in the ones where they, like the Roman amphoras that they know were used to carry wine, they almost never find ethanol. They find other stuff. What he found was three things. Beeswax, which you only find if there's honey. Rice, found traces of rice. And uh, tartrates, tartaric acid. From anywhere else at any other time, that would probably have meant grapes. But not in China and not 10,000 years ago. They had grapes, they had wild species, but they weren't common. Uh, McGovern thinks it was probably hawthorn, which he, he says is like a chalky apple. It's a fruit right, that has sugar in it. 
Now, if you mix all that stuff together and ground it up and let it sit, you'd have a hard time keeping it from fermenting. Right? The, the wild yeast, the, the ambient yeast in the air would grab onto that. There's a lot of sugar in there. They would want to make it into booze. What McGovern had found was the mother Eve of booze. Right? Honey makes mead, rice makes sake, fruit makes wine and brandy. It's the oldest, the evidence that he found on this shard, it's the oldest example of human controlled fermentation that anybody's ever found, 10,000 years. I've held this. Um, it's in his office. It's sitting in a, in a Ziploc on his shelf. Uh, <laughs> And I asked to hold it, and he, he put on gloves. He made me put on gloves. He opened the thing. I mean, it was a big deal. But it was a big deal. It's the oldest thing I've ever held. Um, and and it, it did give the sense of a profound connection to the first home brewer, right? Um, whatever the ritual was, whatever the ceremony was, this is where it happened, this thing. 10,000 years. That's how long we've been at it, at least. The, taming this natural process, domesticating it, domesticating yeast, while the yeast domesticated us, right? Please give me more sugar. I will roll over with my belly up and wag my tail if you will just give me more sugar, right? That's the key, right? Here's that the only other slide. <laughs> Does anybody recognize this? It's sugar. it's sugar, yeah, it's glucose, exactly. Simplest of simple sugars. Six carbons in a hexagon, some hydrogens and oxygens dangling off the corners. This is the most important molecule on Earth. Not water. Water's medium, not message. This is message. Sugar's power. Just about every form of life on Earth uses this, the energy stored in all those chemical bonds in the lines right, to stay alive. Sugar's structure. You get variations in molecules. You get different kinds of sugars. You can attach them together in a bunch of different ways. And instead of having a monosaccharide, a single sugar, you can have polysaccharides. You can have bigger and bigger sugars. Connect them connect these glucose molecules together in one specific way, and you get cellulose. The most common organic molecule on Earth, wood, paper, right? It's just repeating elements of that. Those, that's the subunit. Connect that same molecule in a different way, and you get the starches, amylose and amylopectin, right? Sugar is literally, the, this is just an aside. I'm going to do that a lot. Sugar is literally the backbone of our genes, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid. The ribo in there is ribose. It's a sugar. We're made of this. It's our storage medium. So that's all neat, right? That's cool. And like I said, yeast eat simple sugars, mono and disaccharides primarily, excrete carbon dioxide, make ethanol. So that's all fine if you have a source of simple sugar. Apples have a lot of those simple sugars. Honey, tons, right? Put honey out in water and you automatically get mead. Grapes, grapes are awesome, 25% simple sugar. Every single varietal of wine you've ever had is one grape species, Vitis vinifera, lucky enough to survive an ice age and show up in the Fertile Crescent, Transcaucasian mountain area, just about when people wanted to plant stuff and make booze. One researcher told me if, if human beings had evolved on a, a Pacific island, or had started cities on Pacific islands instead of in the Transcaucasian mountains, then we'd have you know, hundreds of different species of coconut, and grape would be a rare thing that you found in the whole food once in a while. Um, Okay, so that's all fine, right? But what if your most easily accessible agricultural product stores its sugar as starch? Because here's the problem. You know how uh, we in the room, unless one of you is a, is a mutant, cannot digest cellulose. We, don't, we just don't know how to do it. But we can digest starch. We, there's an enzyme in our saliva that does it. There's an amylase, an enzyme that digests starch in our saliva that begins that process. Yeast can't do either of those things. Um, so if it's grain or rice or corn, this is barley, stores all that sugar as starch, what do you do? Grain, grains are, are fascinating. Grain, they're basically little life bombs. There's an embryo, a plant embryo in there, and then uh, starch to store fuel like, an e like a yolk in an animal egg. That's what that starch is. Um, when it's time to grow, the seeds, the barley corns or the grains, make enzymes that convert that starch into sugar, that bre that, the amylases that break it down. Um, so, uh, and why would you want to do that? Well, fermenting and distilling eventually are like value adds, basically, right? You have a whole field full of that stuff. It's hard to get it to market. But if you, have, if you take that whole field and you turn it into a barrel of something that you can actually charge more for, it's easier to get to the market. People want to pay more money for it, right? I mean, it's a, it's a value add. Okay, so the way that we do that in the West is with a process called malting, like single malt scotch, right? 
And uh, malting basically is, uh, this is Glenord malting. It's owned by Diageo. It's in the north of Scotland. Diageo is a big transnational drinks company. They do um, 80, almost 84 million pounds of barley into malt a year. It's like seven trucks a day, every day of the year. It only takes about 11 people to run the plant. But basically what they're doing in this place is letting barley, is tricking barley into thinking that it's growing. They let it germinate. So it grows a little bit. It starts the biochemical processes going of making those enzymes, converting those starches into sugars, and then they arrest the process. They stop it so they have access to the enzymes, and then you can mix it in with other grains, and you can make beer out of it, distill beer, and you get whiskey. Basically, anything that we make that's fermented or distilled in the West starts with malt, or the enzymes that you can extract from the malting process. All right, that's fine. But what if you were working with rice? So if you're making sake or rice wine, like in Japan, uh, they don't use malting. They actually polish away all of the, the rice bran, the thing that makes rice brown. Those are the layers that make those enzymes. What they do is they infect the rice with another fungus. Yeast is a fungus. They, uh, the fungus is called koji. Have you heard of this? You know about this? The sake, some of the sake fans probably know about koji. Koji is a, it, it's a, it's a fungus. It makes um, proteases and amylases. It breaks down proteins, breaks down starches. It's the basis for almost every Asian food. It's how they make tofu and vinegar and, uh, and sake. Um, it's a Aspergillus arisei. And so if you know anything about plants, that would make you nervous because most of the Aspergillus species are total bastards. Um, they make uh, aflatoxins. They're carcinogenic. The clinical literature includes phrases like bloody ball of mucus in the lungs. Um, they're horrifying, but not koji. Koji has all the genes that do all that stuff, but it, they're all turned off. It's domesticated. It's another tame fungus. We tamed it to do one thing, make rice sugary so yeast can eat it. It's been around since 300 BC. All right, so fascinating process. So interesting, in fact, that this guy, Jokichi Takamine, who's a chemist born in 1854, thought that he could commercialize it to not just sacrify process of turning starch into sugar is called sacrification, not just to sacrifice rice, but barley too. And this was an incredible insight on his part because in the late 1880s, researchers like the Buckner brothers were still trying to figure out what enzymes were. You know, People had just really agreed that yeast were the things that did fermentation about 20 years before. That was the discovery that put Louis Pasteur on the map, was saying, yeah, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it's the yeast, you guys. Right? Think about that, 10,000 years, right? of using the process of making fermented and distilled stuff, and nobody knew what was doing it until the 1860s, 1870s. And nobody knew how it worked until much later. It's the beginning of biochemistry. This realization, fermentation, yeast, converting sugar to ethanol. All right, Takamine thought that he could, do, could convert that process and commercialize it. And he actually, uh, he actually figured out how to grow koji on rice bran, throwaway product, right, that the, the sake makers didn't want. It was cheaper. It would actually make more sugar. And if you're a big distiller, sugar is actually money. You want more sugar because you get more ethanol out of it. He was hired by the Whiskey Trust, which before Prohibition was the largest distiller in the world. It was the American distilling conglomerate to come to the U.S., build a facility, and try to commercialize that process here to make whiskey without malt. Zero malt scotch instead of single malt, right? Um, he, uh, he came, this, uh, his, his English language biographer is a woman named Joan Bennett, and she points out he came pretty close. They actually sold a, uh, <laughs> they actually sold a product for a while called Bonsai. Again, a little bit on the nose. Um, but it, it, things didn't work out. One of his facilities burned down under mysterious circumstances. You can imagine the people who made malt were not so happy about this idea. Um, and uh, the relationship with the Whiskey Trust fell apart. Didn't, uh, it didn't work out. But, uh, um, so we still today have this process where we, we malt to make whiskey and, and make beer. Um, I don't want you to feel too bad for him. He took his process and uh, turned it into what John Bennett calls the Alka-Seltzer of the 1890s, um, the stuff Taka Diastes. And he got so rich that Park Davis, the pharmaceutical company, bought it out. Oh, I should say, one thing made uh, Takamine unique was that unlike most scientists of the time, he didn't mind uh, patenting his processes. So the process for making that koji stuff was the first English language biotechnology patent, depending on how you count that kind of stuff. Um, eventually, Park Davis bought, this, bought the copyright on this stuff and set him up in a lab. They wanted him to figure out how to isolate another strange and wondrous chemical that nobody knew how it worked. Um, at the time, they were calling it epinephrine. He figured out the process and named it adrenaline, and he patented that too, which led to a bunch of lawsuits because they made so much money. Eventually, 
a judge named Learned Hand in 1911 said, you guys got to leave Park Davis alone. It is, in fact, legal to patent a naturally occurring product. This is the decision. This is the basis for the modern biotechnology industry because of Koji, because of the failure of Koji, really, but because of that. Um, Takamine got so rich, he moved, to, he moved to New York. He had a, a beautiful mansion. He was kind of an unofficial technological ambassador, and eventually it was his money that paid for these. These are the cherry trees in Washington, D.C. He's the guy who bought these um, for the 2,000 cherry trees. All right, so uh, I'm going um, to jump uh, from here back uh, about 2,000 years um, to this place. Uh, ancient Alexandria. You know ancient Alexandria. You know Alexandria, the library, right? The, the, uh, all that Caesar, Mark Antony, Cleopatra drama, right? Um, the lighthouse, founded by Alexander the Great. It's the first modern city. Uh, it's built on a gridiron designed to take advantage of prevailing winds off the desert. It has a beautiful lighthouse. It has plumbing. It has, uh, it has the library that I mentioned. Um, it has automatons. They loved automatons. They, they had steam engines, and they would have, like, if you would open a temple door, and then the, the, the robot god in the back would move and catch the sunlight. You could put a coin into a, into a slot, and, and, a, and a robot bird would sing a song, and the, the temple fire would light up. They loved that kind of stuff. They had parades for it. This is a city of engineers. They're technologists, right? They're technologists. And, and more than that, though, they're alchemists, right? One of the things that the labs there are working on is alchemy. Now, alchemy gets kind of, in my opinion, gets kind of a raw deal. Because what we know about alchemy is like, oh, they were trying to convert lead into gold. It's the Middle Ages. They're con artists looking for eternal life. It's Harry Potter stuff. Fine. Uh, philosophically, they were wrong about almost everything. But methodologically, they weren't. What they were doing was inventing the, the, the infrastructure for modern science, critically coming up with a lab, right? And experimentation on nature and the stuff in that lab. So one of the most famous of them uh, is, uh, is this woman. Um, this is Maria the Jewess. Uh, we only know mostly, I know, well, hey, it's, I didn't name her. Uh, <laughs> we know about her mostly from a, a biographer who wrote about her much later named Zosimus the Panapolitan. You gotta get a the in my name, right? <laughs> How awesome would that? Um, uh, he, and he never really said when she was alive, but people think roughly, you know, sort of the turn of the first millennium. Um, you, do you know what a Bon Marie is or a Marion Bod in a lab, a laboratory double boiler? Have you heard of this? So she invented that, or it's ascribed to her. It's not the only piece of laboratory equipment she invented. She also came up with this. The one on the left is called a Keratakis. The one on the right is a Tribikos. Forgive my ancient Greek. My pronunciation is terrible. Um, in Arabic, you would call these things put together an alambic or an alembic. This is a still. She came up with it. She wanted to heat stuff and separate it out. Um, there's some disagreement about this. The still could have been first invented in, in China. But um, the, the, the way I want you to think about a still is as a separation technology, a high, high technology for separating things. So how do we separate stuff? Filtration, you separate things by size, right? Centrifugation. You're separating things by weight, essentially. You increase gravity, and the heavier stuff falls to the bottom. Um, modern practices, gas chromatography or gel electrophoresis, you separate things by electrical charge, right? What a still does is separate things based on evaporation pressure, based on volatility. More volatile stuff, things that evaporate easily go over the top first. Things that evaporate with more energy go over later. And you can separate things out. You can get rid of things you don't want and keep the things you do, like ethanol and water. Different molecules evaporate at different temperatures. Now, wh uh, what, uh, no, it's fine, I'll stop, whatever, it's cool. <laughs> um, it, what, what uh, probably what Maria was trying to do was uh, not, did not involve booze. They had access to Roman wine in Alexandria, but she was probably putting in stuff like sulfur. The, 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 um, the alchemists were interested in these spirits in inanimate objects, right? That's where we get that word too. Um, so she was putting in metals and liquids and stuff like that. She did figure out you need to use copper and you need to use solder and you need to keep the heat insulated and keep the heat from getting out. All the basic tenets of distilling. Nobody really knows if anybody ever put that wine in the still to see what would happen. I like to think of her lab as being kind of like a graduate student lab though and I figured come on they must have put it. They were drinking all the time. You got to they put booze in the still, right? Um, it's not clear whether they did or not. There's other evidence. You know, the technology either spreads or gets invented somewhere else. There's evidence of it between like 150 AD and 400 AD in India. There's some uh, reference to it in China in 980. Wine that burns, the alcohol content would have to be high enough for it to burn so that it would have to be distilled. Uh, in about 1000 AD, you see references in Russia to bread wine. 
right? Vodka. In the 1200s, there's a big shot alchemist named Albertus Magnus who writes about burning water. Um, but in the mid 1280s, this guy is the one who really puts it on the map. He's a physician from Bologna named um, Taddeo Alderodi. He writes a book called Concilia Medicinalia where he um, describes the process for making something called aqua vita, the water of life. Um, and this stuff was magic. It would cure diseases, it would relieve pain, it would fix bad breath, it would purify spoiled wine, it would preserve meat, you could draw essences out of plants and smell them later, right? For the first time, these people who basically were just witch doctors, right, finally had a chemical that did something, <laughs> right? They could make a medicine, it felt like a medicine, and in fact, it was just about the only medicine that they gave anybody who was dying of the Black Plague because they didn't have anything else, which contributed to the spread of alcoholism across Europe. Um, what Alderati also figured out was that if you added a serpentine coil from the top of a still and then immersed that in cold water, the vapors that were coming out of that still would condense more quickly and you'd get liquid, right? He, he put sort of the capping technology on top, of, on top of a still and it spread across Europe. Everyone starts distilling. You end up with places like this. This is, I think, Jim Beam, that's the top of the still at Jim Beam. That, that's a column still. It goes down six floors from there. It's 60 or 70 feet tall. Um, or this, this is St. George Spirits in Alameda. It's one of my favorite distilleries. Um, and uh, this is a new one. This is uh, New Caledonia in Washington, DC. Um, the columns are an interesting addition because what the columns do is let you finesse that separation process further. The, the stuff you're distilling goes in the top, steam goes up the bottom, and the chemicals fractionate out in the middle. So whatever thing you want, you can kind of put an outlet pipe at a different height uh, on those columns and get, get out the stuff that you want. It was a later addition um, to the process. Uh, basically, you put the stuff you want to distill in that big pot and set it boiling, and then it's plumbing. You turn knobs. Um, scroll down a second. I'm forgetting one important point. Right. So um, that precision is important because otherwise you have to do you have to just time your process of distilling so you don't have like methanol in it, which is toxic, or you don't have kind of yuckier flavors, which is what comes out at the end of a distillation. You just want the middle, the heart, they call it. Um, but the important thing that I, I want you to take away from this is the precision that finally evolved. Right? We go from this natural process that nobody knows how it works to one that we begin to identify how it works and can take kind of control of or at least domesticate to taking that natural, that scientific, that the science of that and turning it into a technological process, one that's precise and one that we use all the time. That's what's happened there. Um, I have a couple more things I want to say, but I, I, feel like, uh, I feel like I would be cheating you if I didn't talk a little bit about hangovers. <laughs> Is that true? I don't want to just get out of here without talking about hangovers. Um, Nobody knows anything about hangovers. <laughs> uh, that's not totally true. There's not a lot of science. Here's what uh, one of the things I love about the science of booze is of all of the recreational drugs that people take, whatever your feelings about the legality and morality of that are, we take a lot of them, right? Of all of those drugs, the only one for which scientists have not articulated a mechanism for how it works in the brain is ethanol, the one we have taken the longest. They don't really know. They've got some ideas. Um, you know, if you ask a researcher who studies this stuff, well, how does marijuana work, or methamphetamine, or opium? They, they know the receptor, they know the region of the brain, they kind of know what's going on. Ethanol, eh, yeah, we got an idea. A couple of notions for receptors, regions of the brain. Um, partially that may be because if you really press a neuroscientist on this, they don't really know how the brain works either. <laughs> they have some good ideas. <laughs> really. um, a lot of the research in alcohol and how it affects the human body is on uh, dependency and on binge drinking. As you would imagine, right? Those are problems and they kill people and they hurt people and they cost a lot of money. So, people, so research trying to figure that stuff out. But the research on like, I, 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 try to, I try to think of my book as taking place about three sips into your second round. Um, you know, the, the, the pivot point of my book is the moment when a bartender serves you a drink. It's, it, it's, it's about what happens when you have one drink or two drinks, right? But sometimes uh, you mess up, right? <laughs> Hang, a hangover is a symptom of that. Um, uh, there is not a lot of science on hangovers. I will tell you that almost everything that they told you the first day, uh, the day before your first weekend night of college is wrong, or at least unproven. So you're sitting there and you're thinking, it's dehydration. It's not dehydration. 
uh, your electrolyte levels go back to normal and you're still hungover and you can rehydrate and still have the hangover. Um, people think that because alcohol suppresses a hormone called vasopressin, it's an antidiuretic hormone, it's the hormone that keeps you from peeing all the time. Have too much alcohol, now you're peeing all the time, plus you're not drinking water, you're drinking beer, whatever. Um, so yeah, you're dehydrated, but that's not the hangover. People think that it's too much sugar, it's not. Your sugar levels are fine when you're hungover. People think that it is, uh, oh, I had uh, impure alcohol, congeners, right? I should have had clear liquor instead of bourbon. It's not. You get just as hungover with vodka as you do with bourbon. Um, some people report a worse hangover with bourbon, but it's mostly anecdotal. Um, more complicated, acetaldehyde toxicity. No, acetaldehyde is hard to measure, but your acetaldehyde levels are zero. Methanol toxicity. There's some methanol in anything fermented and distilled. The symptoms look like they overlap. It would be great because it's a good excuse for the hair of the dog. I can explain that if you want, but it's probably not methanol. Nobody really knows. What it looks like is an inflammatory response. Like if you have the flu, something, right? You feel aches, you feel kind of stupid, you have gut problems, your headache. Also has some overlap symptomatology with uh, migraine. So there are a few things that have ever been shown in real studies to have an effect on a migraine, or uh, sorry, on a hangover. Um, one of them is a drug called Clotam. It's, it's kind of a super high-powered anti-inflammatory that they prescribe for migraines primarily. Uh, you can't get it in the United States. I tried. <laughs> Asked a neurologist. He's like, I'm not prescribing. It's not on the pharmacopoeia. And plus, no, I wouldn't. No, come on. That's stupid. I'm not doing that. Um, I tried to get it from a friend who lived in England to get her to lie to her doctor on the National Health Service. To, she was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Why would I? So I've never tried it. Um, but a few things that are sold over the counter here have been shown in studies to work. Um, peritinol on the, uh, on the left is, um, is a vitamin B6 analog. It's two B6 molecules connected by a sulfur atom. Uh, the, the, uh, the liver care thing is an Ayurvedic uh, therapy that's only been shown to work in studies done by the company that makes it. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Um, and the one on the, on the far right is uh, prickly pear cactus extract, which kind of makes sense because it has uh, mild anti-inflammatory effects, prickly pear. Does. It also makes a very good burrito. Um, the one in the middle is interesting because the one in the middle is, they call it blue seed, and you can't see that well in the picture, I'm sorry. But um, it's uh, f made from a molecule called dihydromyrcetin, which is an extract of a plant called oriental raisin or hovenia, which is used to treat alcohol problems in the traditional Chinese pharmacopoeia. But a, a lab at UCLA looked into it, and it does seem to affect a receptor that looks like in the brain that looks like it's the target for alcohol in that relevant range that I was talking about in that you know up to 0.06 like the the drink and a half range it's a receptor that also that's involved in um, how we feel benzodiazepine drugs like Valium and that makes sense too because those because benzodiazepines and alcohol always have a synergistic effect they'll tell you if you're taking a benzodiazepine don't drink also because you'll knock you right on your ass um, so that's a target that some people are looking at for what receptor ethanol actually affects. And this stuff is supposed to block it. I've tried all of those. I mean, maybe. <laughs> don't trust anecdote, and obviously don't do medical things that I say, because journalist, not doctor, that would be goofy. Um, but, uh, but I mentioned there's an inflammatory response, and so now you're thinking, because you're smart, you're like, well, I'm just going to take ibuprofen, man. Like, right? Anti-inflammatory. Here's the thing. Uh, Ibuprofen has as a side effect gastrointestinal problems. You take a lot of it, you get a GI bleed. You already have gastrointestinal problems from the hangover. So now you're thinking, oh, well, I'll take it with a Pepsid. And now you're taking a fistful of stuff that you're not really sure is going to work, right? Which makes me nervous, I have to admit. But also, you know, so when I was talking about, I, in, in the excerpt of the book that ran and wired, I said I've started taking a couple of ibuprofen, you know, before I go to bed or when I wake up. And people came at me on Twitter. It's like, you're going to get a GI bleed. I'm like, how often do you think I'm doing this? <laughs> Like, no, 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 settle down. This is not, I don't think it's a problem yet. I, of course, I, nobody ever does, right? So, I, anyway. Um, <laughs> but but um, anyway, so I wish I had better news about hangovers. Um, the the anti-inflammatory thing, I think, has, a, has possibilities. Um, so where does that leave us? So I, uh, I was in Japan a couple of weeks ago, family vacation, and um, the, uh, the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo right now is this giant brutalist uh, skyscraper looking place. Very ugly. But the original Imperial Hotel in Tokyo was built by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's one of the most beautiful buildings anywhere. Uh, like so many Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, it fell down in the 1960s. <sighs> Not a good engineer, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but the one place in the building that still has the original Frank Lloyd Wright appointments uh, is the old bar. So you can go to the old Imperial Bar in the hotel, and it has beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright 
wall hangings and, and, and the, you know, the tiles and stuff. It's really nice. And it's a very nice cocktail bar. So I wanted to go. Um, because I, 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 I ordered this drink called the Gemini. It's their house drink. It was terrible. But the coaster is really nice, right? That's a beautiful coaster. Because I wanted to feel the connection to history, to a Frank Lloyd Wright building, um, and, and to or the history of cocktails. And that's a thing that alcohol will, will give you, right? Is that connection to connection down through deep time, through shallow time with Frank Lloyd Wright, and then deeper, the people who first started making gin, for example, right? Which people, which human beings were making a thousand years before they knew how it worked, right? They were making it without really knowing how to make it. They still don't really know why we taste it the way we do. I and mean, we make this stuff. And it affects our senses, right? Our sense of smell and taste. And you and I would taste the same thing and tell each other that if we told each other that it tasted the same to us, we might be talking about actually different flavors in our heads, or we might taste entirely different things in it, and nobody really knows why. It alters our bodies, it changes our minds, and nobody really knows how. They're working on it. We taste it differently, we feel its effects differently, every culture that uses it has different rituals for it and manifests the effects of that differently. We have cracked open yeast um, and the other microbes that are responsible for it and begun to understand that biology. Yeast are an incredibly important model organism in science. They were the first organism that there was ever a genetic sequence for. Um, so we've kind of gone from the agricultural process of domesticating a microbe we only understood vaguely to the cold precision of genetic engineering. But really, we were making booze before we had science, much less before we had booze science. Now, now that we have all that science, now that we understand it a little bit more, I don't want you to think that that makes the stuff that we drink less magical, less amazing. Um, I'm, uh, I guess, paraphrasing Arthur C. Clarke a little bit, right? Magic is just advanced technology. You know, the science that we use to make this stuff is what makes the magic. What I want to argue and what I want to leave you with is this notion that when you are tasting something that you're drinking, whatever it is, if you're tasting those, the, the, you know, the strawberry notes in a nice glass of white wine or, or the, the smoke in a peated Isla whiskey, that while you are tasting all those things, what you're actually tasting, those flavors and aromas you're tasting, is civilization. Thank you. That's what I got. Look, it's my desktop. Sorry about that. Uh, I, can, I, can, uh, I can do questions for a bit. We have time for that? Is that okay? I can't tell if you're walking out or asking questions. You have to tell me. Oh, good. Sorry. Um, so it sounds like a lot of the process of uh, making booze is to get to the sugar. Um, so, you know, can I just put water and sugar and. Yeah, please. I, listen, some of my hyperbole is intentional, so you go ahead and challenge away. I'm, no, uh, oh, if you may. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Well, I mean, that's what rum like, is. Domino sugar and make. Yeah, that's rum. Okay. Right. I mean, so rum. A, a lot of the rum that we drink is. I mean, not exactly. Well, uh, let me calibrate that slightly. Um, uh, uh, most rum is made from molasses. Molasses is a byproduct of processing sugar cane into sugar. Right. So, you, you, if you want to make white you know, powdered sugar, you, you end up with a lot of molasses, which ferments really easily. In fact, it ferments so easily that you, you really want your rum distillery next to your sugarcane processing plant because it comes right out of there and you got to get it into the still because otherwise all the wild stuff's going to colonize and it'll go bad. You can also make a drink called rum agricole. Rum agricole is made from cane juice. So you, know, you can just squeeze sugarcane. Have you ever tasted it? It's really, it's delicious, just like that. that it, it's not super sweet. It's just really good. Um, and you can distill that, make a rum agricole. That, that was a, it's a, product that got made in a lot of the former French colonies in, in South America and in the Caribbean. Um, you can find them. They're, they're delicious. They're really interesting. They smell kind of funky and grassy. Um, but yeah, and if you're making moonshine, right, the, you know, famously moonshine is supposed to, is whiskey, right? Is unaged whiskey. But, um, but, a, but like cheap moonshine, especially present day cheap illegal moonshine is often like they go buy a lot of sugar ferment that and distill it. Or they use any sugar substrate. I've seen, uh, I've seen a mash made from donuts. <laughs> Tastes as good as you would expect. <laughs> what else? So a lot of the liquors have like precursors, like whiskey is distilled beer. Right. And brandy is distilled wine. wine. What, who thought up vodka? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, a lot of people who think about booze or who write about it 
go by category, right? It's a perfectly good heuristic. Wine, beer, tequila, rum, scotch, whatever. Like they write about a specific thing. I actually, I, I, I'm, I'm intentionally forcing a different heuristic, which is process, which goes, and this is the structure of the book, uh, starts with yeast, goes to sugar, you ferment that, you distill it, you can age it in a barrel, right? Then you taste and smell it, take a drink, has effect on your body, on your brain. Um, and, and, and any alcohol, any, any booze falls under those categories. So vodka um, is easy because vodka, you can use any substrate you want. And famously, it's like, oh, Russian had potatoes. But you can make it out of anything because all you're doing is just running it through the still so many times that you're stripping out every molecule except ethanol and water. In fact, in the United States, if you're selling vodka, that's all that's allowed to be in it. Those are the only molecules. It's just H2O and ethanol. That's it. Which is weird because they taste different, right? So you go, well, how does that work? Maybe the levels of alcohol are different sometimes, but if, it's, if, they're all, if they all say 80 proof, if they're all 40% ABV, if it's all 40% ethanol molecules and 60% water molecules, what's going on? Some of it might just be marketing. Theater is super important with booze. Marketing in the theater of, you know, imagine like that, that bottle of red wine that you had on that trip where you got lost and you found that perfect little trattoria in Tuscany and you got that bottle and it was like the best bottle of red wine and then you get the stuff at home like watching it in front of a Star Trek rerun. It doesn't quite, <laughs> you know, it's not really as good um, out of the mason jar. It's like, well, it's still good. Don't get me wrong. It's a plus I love this is the one with the green Orion slave girl. Um, but uh, <laughs> so it always makes wine better. Um, but uh, there is a, there's a, a hypothesis. I, had a, I have a paper um, that's pretty great that suggests that the, the relationship between those molecules can change depending on levels because the water forms what are called clathrates. Basically, there are um, kind of H2O crystals that surround the ethanol, and the different shapes of those crystals might be perceptible as a, as a matter of flavor or aroma. It's, a, I mean, it's tantalizing as a, as a paper, and it was a pretty good paper um, that I don't know that anybody followed up on. It also of course, came out of a lab in Russia, as you would expect. So, What else? Uh, you mentioned the hair of the dog. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, good. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so uh, there used to be a whole class of cocktails called pick-me-ups. And the pick-me-ups were drinks that were designed to drink in the morning, because everybody was drunk all the time. <laughs> um, Awesome. It's probably not like it's what it's like at Yahoo, not Google. You guys don't, don't like that. Um, uh, you don't see many of them anymore. So uh, the the last one in the morning, the what acceptable morning drinks now? A blood, the Bloody Family, like a Bloody Maria or a Caesar or a Bloody Mary, right? And, and a mimosa. You know, you see those. Uh, the Corpse Reviver Number Two. Do you know this drink? I love that drink. It's a great drink. The Corpse Survivor number two does not refer to zombies. The corpse in that name is the hungover person who has dragged himself into a bar before going to work that day to try to come back from it. So that, that's, where, that's, that's hair of the dog, right? The idea is that if you're hungover, you have a little bit of booze, and that makes you not feel the hangover anymore. So probably all it does is just delay the hangover because you, you, you're more relaxed about it. But there is a theory. I mentioned methanol toxicity. Right? There is a theory that says that a hangover are actually the symptoms of a very, very small amount of methanol. So methanol is really cool. It's a different alcohol, right? And alcohol dehydrogenase, we all make that too. That's how we process alcohol in our own bodies. will work on methanol also. But instead of changing the, instead of having ethanol, which it can change into acetaldehyde in us, when it works on methanol, it changes it into formaldehyde, which is bad. It right? doesn't last long in the body. It's not good for you, but it kind of goes away. But it turns into formic acid, which is the stuff in ant venom. So you get acidosis. Formic acid interferes with the enzyme that we use to process oxygen in our cells. So the, most, uh, the heaviest oxygen users in our body are the eyes and the brain. Right? That's why when you have oxygen deprivation, the first thing that happens is you stop seeing colors. And then you get that tunnel right, that closes in when you're not breathing. Um, so uh, formic acid messes with the enzyme that does that. It's why methanol toxicity will make you go blind. And eventually you get, it goes into the brain, messes with the brain's ability to deal with oxygen. You get Parkinsonian tremor. Eventually it kills you. But if you show up in an emergency room with methanol toxicity, not that I'm recommending this, 
uh, the first thing the doctors will do is they will give you a giant dose of ethanol because ethanol displaces the methanol off the enzyme. The enzyme would much rather work on ethanol. They hit you with the ethanol. The enzyme throws the methanol overboard, goes to work on the ethanol, and you excrete the methanol through your breath and, and you, you pee it out, basically. That's the therapy for it. So the notion is if a hangover is methanol toxicity, you're going to have another drink. The ethanol will displace the methanol off the enzyme, and you will feel better. That's the theory. Nobody has, it's the, that's the hypothesis. Nobody's proved that. It's a great just so story. Uh, doesn't, it sounds terrible. <laughs> it just it sounds like an awful solution to me that I, that I have not tried. The other bad thing about this is that, um, according to some studies, uh, the kind of person who, um, it's like 10% of the people who admit to trying hair of the dog regularly also end up becoming alcoholics. They sound related, but not causal, right? I don't know. So uh, I know that a lot of alcohol relies on wild yeast, but when did people first Re relies start, on sorry uh, on wild yeast. Oh, wild yeast, sure. So when did people start isolating yeast and actually like culturing it? Yeah, um, I, I I don't know if there's a great answer to that. Um, there is a notion that you you can imagine like well at first it's all uh, just your starter right like just like people had sourdough starters that they would pass down. So somewhat you'd go well that winery over there makes good wine regularly and that winery on that hill doesn't. So I'm going to buy it from over there without knowing that like, it's because their yeast sucks and their yeast works really well. Um, but it's, uh, it, you, you, really, you, don't, you get until the, the late 1880s when um, people start to really kind of consciously study the yeast strain and make sure it's working. And that, a, a lot of that comes out of, um, uh, which brewery is it? I'm not going to remember, but a specific, the, a, a, a lager maker in Germany where they were like, we're going to have a lab. We're going to understand our yeast. We're going to figure out where it comes from. And they, for a while, they even thought they had a unique um, a unique yeast. Um, it's Carlsberg. So they started calling it Saccharomyces carlsbergensis. Um, that, that was making their exact uh, lager. Turns out it probably was a mix of a couple other strains that nobody knows where one of them came from yet, actually. But, um, but, it, was, uh, but it was late, you know, where people started to really focus on that. And there's still a controversy in, um, in distilling, especially about how important the strain of yeast is, whether you can just use any old commodity yeast or whether you need your specific one. Brewers, especially if you know any home brewers, you know this, they'll be very specific about like, that's a yeast that you make a very specific kind of beer with, ale, whatever, and, uh, and they want to stick with it. Hey, um, you mentioned the alchemists and the, the early alcohol things, and they mixed them with herbals and made mm -hmm. medicines, and, and being Italian, I'm a fan of Amaro's and sure. herbal things, and I get my Frené Branca after dinner. Um, do you think there's a direct must link? Be from San Francisco. <laughs> no, 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 New York, no. born and bred. Um, do you think there was a direct link from that? I mean, did they take the medicines and carry it forward, and people said, you know what, I'm going to drink this anytime, <laughs> or, or was it lost and rediscovered? Um, you know, you can still get the drinks that are, if not the actual recipe, descendants of the recipe from the monks taking the herbs in their garden and macerating it in neutral spirit or distilling it with, you know, chartreuse. Yeah, I guess. And Benedictine. Mm -hmm. I mean, Benedictine, right? <laughs> Benedictine monks make Benedictine. That's why it's called that. The, those are, I like the, the, for that, that's why I like the Amari and, and chartreuse and Benedictine especially because I feel like that's a connection to at least the, to the 1600s and what they were making then. It's, you know, same, same recipe. It probably tastes different for a lot of other reasons, but but uh, you know, if what you're asking is when did it stop being medicine and become fun, yeah. <laughs> sort of, right? Um, that is less clear. Although there's some, and the, there's there's a chunk of history in the in the book, but there's not a lot of cocktail history. I'll, I'll admit, but I, I've read a lot of it and I like it. So you know, some of the that mixing traces back, interestingly, I think, not to um, bars, but to pharmacies. So um, pharmacies were also allowed to dispense alcohol in this country in the mm, early 18s, so call it 10s, 20s, right? Pharmacists were allowed to dispense alcohol. They were also allowed to dispense things like extract of cocaine and opiates and stuff like that, right? And um, they were also places where, unlike bars, women could go. So they were more social in their own way. There's a book called uh, Fix the Pumps by a guy named Darcy O'Neill that's great about this. And uh, one of the things that, that Darcy says is like, so, they, so these... Uh, these pharmacists were making like bitters, tonics, right? That you could mix with soda water. That's where Coca-Cola comes from. It's where Dr. Pepper, like Dr. Pepper. Yeah. 
that's his his recipe right or you know Boker's bitters or Angostura bitters that's where all that stuff comes from these ingredients so you begin to be like oh well I'll mix that up and maybe I'll put some ice in it and there's ice cream you could have ice cream at the soda shop the soda fountain too um, so uh, that's where at least what we would consider the kind of the modern version of the cocktail comes from, and it transitions, right? It transitions from being a medication, or at least something that we all just say is a medication, into something that's rec <laughs> into, into something that's recreational. Right. Thank right. you. Uh, I like I like some really old whiskeys. Uh, unfortunately, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> unfortunately, they're very expensive. Um, I know. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> So I, I'm wondering if, it, do you see a, a future in which we may have a better scientific understanding of what the aging process does and we may be able to in, uh, imitate it in a shorter time period and get them less expensive? With Holy them? smoke, are there some people who would like to know the answer to that? <laughs> uh, sure. Well, and, and for real, not just as an abstract concept, but if you are a, a small distiller, a craft distiller, who's trying to make a brown spirit, um, you don't have time to wait. You don't have enough stock to wait for 10 years before you can start selling things. You need to start selling stuff now, and if you'd like to make whiskey, you want to accelerate the process. So without understanding the chemistry well yet, because they because they don't, um, one of the approaches is to use a smaller barrel. You probably know this, right? You use, I, a, small, uh, you, you, you use a smaller barrel and you get more surface uh, more surface of the more surface of the wood exposed to more of, relatively more of the liquid. The problem with that is you get all the extractives out of the wood but you don't get any of the oxidation or esterification that comes with just time. So people will try other tricks to try to make that happen. There's a, <laughs> there's a distillery that actually uh, like plays heavy bass music at their barrels to try to get the vibration so that they get more <laughs> exposure and mix it up more. Um, there's a company called Terracentia that says that they have a, a process that combines um, sonification or sonication. Sonification, I guess, is if you're playing the video game. A anyway, the, um, uh, the, the combines a sound-like pro processing sound with um, uh, with some kind of filtration technology that they can make something taste older. I've had it. It tastes, I guess, fine. It didn't necessarily taste older to me. So you're not necessarily convinced yet? No, I'm not convinced of that. Uh, and I um, a and I think also what is happening is that a lot of distillers are starting to try to say that the flavors that you get from something that is not aged for a long time are not a bug but a feature. And they're saying, oh, no, we're making something different here. But I know that there are small distillers who can age for not for not eight years, but some shorter amount of time and still produce something that's really spectacular. So there, there, probably, there are some methodological things going on. Whether anybody will ever be able to say, oh, okay, well, here's my oldness extract, you know, doop, 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 and then there you go. I, I don't know, although that's standard practice in some of the most traditional drinks you can think of. If you're making cognac, right, super Appalachian controlled, like, a lot of rules, old kind of brand. Cognac is brandy from a the particular region, made in a particular way. You're allowed to add something called a, my French is as bad as my ancient Greek, I'm sorry, a bloise. And what it is essentially is tannic tea. And they'll, they'll keep the same kind of water soaking in really tannic wood for 50 years. And they can add that to their product. And it makes it darker and you get a, a more of a, like a big, mellow, older flavor. Um, and some winemakers do that too. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll age uh, in a big steel vat, but they'll kind of soak tea bags full of sawdust essentially in there to get some of the wood flavors into it. Um, so yeah, that, they're, they're trying. But the, the specific processes do seem to require time in the equation. Seems right, thanks. So I guess uh, as a piggyback question off of that and a lot of the things you mentioned, um, you know, we're about like the process and you have like this overarching idea of the process. Is there a piece of that process that's sort of yet to be invented? I mean, I think a lot of the things that you just mentioned are ways we can use modern science and understanding to replace or advance or quicken or make that process more efficient. But mm -hmm. is there some like great leap of technology waiting for booze that will take it to the next sort of amazing euphoric level? Let me give you two. Uh, one is genetically engineering yeast to do other stuff. So um, there's a researcher in Australia named Isaac Pretorius, and he uh, worked on a yeast that, I'm gonna radically simplify this, I'm sorry, Saki, this is terrible. Basically would take crummy grapes and make decent wine. Like, because it, had, it was able to, to break a particular molecular bond that was liberating a flavor that you wanted in Sauvignon Blanc that they were growing in too hot a climate for Sauvignon Blanc, essentially. Um, there's a woman in France named Sylvie Dequan, and she's working on yeasts that will make wine that tastes good but has lower alcohol levels. You might know this, but like, especially in California wines, alcohol, ABV is creeping up 
because the yeast that they're using and the process they're using is more efficient. They're getting more alcohol off the sugar, so you end up with you know wine that used to be eight percent, nine percent. You can get it at fifteen, which is super hot, and it does. I mean, it makes it's a flavor that people like, but also you're you know you're blitzed on a glass of wine, right? Um, so she's working on yeast that won't do that. You still get the flavor, but not the alcohol. Of course, nobody in the world, I shouldn't say that. If you have a GMO yeast, you can't sell it in Europe, right? And you'd have trouble selling it here. You'd get controversy. So like after Pretorius made that yeast, then he, once he knew which genes it was, he went back and did a standard uh, breeding, you know, to, to grow. He, he grew, the, grew a strain up without using GMO, uh, without genetically modifying it, and, sold, and he sells that. Um, so there's room in the yeast, right? to mess with yeast and come up with something new. The other thing um, that's uh, probably true, <laughs> uh, there's a researcher in England who works on drugs and alcohol named David Nutt, N-U-T-T. And uh, he, was, uh, he was actually in charge of UK drug policy until he had the temerity to suggest that uh, they were over-regulating marijuana and under-regulating alcohol. So they fired him. <laughs> he says, that he has a few different compounds based on benzodiazepines that if you take them, they make you feel exactly the same way as having a drink or two, but they're reversible, that they have an antidote, he says. So it's synthahol, right? Um, he's published on the idea, and he's published sort of the vague how it might work, and he says he's tried his own and taken the antidote and it worked, but as far as I've found, if you guys have one of these papers, tell me, he, he hasn't sent me a paper. I asked him, he wouldn't talk to me, but he sent me a couple papers. He hasn't published the like, here's the compound, here's the test, here's how I know it works. He says he's, he needs the funding to do it, which is always a dicey thing for a research. Like, if you guys give me more money, then I'll give you the thing. Um, but, intriguing, right? Maybe less fun comes in a pill instead of as a corpse survivor number two. Um, but, but an intriguing advance in how we uh, get buzzed. Anything else? That's a pretty good beat to stop on anyway. Oh, one more. Sure, go ahead. So if you had to pick one favorite drink. <laughs> Cocktail or, yeah. No, see, here's the thing. I, I, I'm, I'm the most annoying person in the world to drink with now. I'm, ter I'm so unpleasant now because, not because I, I, I'm working really hard on not being judgy about people's drinks. Uh, I'm getting there. I'm evolving. You know, is that really a chocolate martini? You really, okay, if you like the chocolate martini, you can have the chocolate martini. Um, but, um, but I also, like, I get all, I, I get that question and I get all contextual. I'm like, well, am I, is it, a, is it hot out? <laughs> is it the end of the day? Is it, is it evening? Am I, or am I about to go out or is this after dinner? Uh, the, the truth is that the thing that kind of got me into this, though there are a lot of things that got me into this, w was single malt whiskey. And, uh, and that, that still, I think, um, along with... Uh, Along with the Shinkansen and rocket ships, I think single malt whiskey may be one of the pinnacles of human achievement. So uh, <laughs> it's probably that. Yeah? Thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs>